Hey, so good morning. My name is Chris Shank, and uh, I work for Texas Parks and Wildlife Wildlife Division. As it says there, I've got one of the best jobs in the world. I am a statewide fire program leader, and I am not a game warden. I am not handsome enough to be a game warden. They have their own TV show. They had to buy 560 new Stetsons because their heads swelled up. Bless their little hearts. So <laughs> here we go. So um, Morgan was very nice to talk about my bio. I told her you could thin that down. Really, the most important thing in my bio is that uh, I live in beautiful Beulah, Texas, Little Bear Ridge, uh, and uh, I'm married to a wonderful lady, <coughs> Mari. She's, she somehow put up with me for 30 some odd years. And Andy the cat is our only livestock right now. Um, and he's a forest cat, so uh, a little bit about me. The other cool thing is um, the Wildlife Division of Texas Parks and Wildlife is privileged to be involved in prescribed burning that has two parts to it. We obviously burn on public lands, wildlife management areas, all close to about 50,000 acres a year. And then we also have another really great option and opportunity. Oops. Okay, I have a very quiet voice. I'll try to project more. Uh, and our option and opportunity is, is to assist private landowners in land management and providing technical guidance. So we actually assist those landowners in putting fire on the ground on their land. Uh, we, we help them get a burn plan put together. And we have the privilege of working behind lock gates uh, and helping those landowners to achieve their, their goals and land management programs. If they choose to use fire, which we think is a good idea, uh, it's just real valuable. Philosophically, uh, when I came into this job, I did come from a, uh, a public lands world, coming to st the state of Texas, which is, uh, I actually came to Texas with the U.S. Forest Service and retired here, uh, but then realizing we're 98% private land, and there were some interesting things. My employer actually was worried I wouldn't be that interested in our private lands burning, to be quite honest. I see that as the growth industry. I see that as a great opportunity. As I started studying burning here in Texas, and I still have lots to learn, what I did kind of learn is that it's a big state, first of all, I got that one figured out. But then whatever we're reporting as burning is not a real big number, something on the order of 300,000 acres. I believe, I truly believe, and I'll just say this right from the get-go, I think that Texas could be seeing five million acres a year burn based on what I think is burnable ground that's not excluded, not in cities, not in full ag production. And the people sitting right here are going to be a huge part of that. Although we play a role in Texas Parks and Wildlife and a myriad of other groups too, um, it's going to be a thousand points of light to get that five million acres. That will be the key for when I actually really retire that I can feel like I've contributed to that. So thank you for, for your commitment to get you know the first million on the books in the next few years. I think it's, it's real doable. And there's just no doubt when you study fire history, you look at your own ranches and farms, you know what you need. And fire is an important cultural tool. So um, my topic is, uh, some, let's see, make sure I press the right button. Uh, planning the burn. So there's a really cool picture. That's either a kangaroo or a big jackrabbit from West Texas. I'm not really sure. So uh, plan planning the burn is um, a real important element. Uh, one of my other hobbies is I'm a pilot, so a lot of times we say plan your flight and fly your plan, or flight and yeah, fly your plan. So uh, planning the burn is an important element. I've got a few objectives here. We, uh, we want at the end of this uh, lesson that you would have an understanding, a basic understanding of prescribed fire burn planning, that you would know what state and local uh, requirements exist for burn plans, and that you would understand the elements of a burn plan and then know where to find resources. I, uh, I don't memorize things. I barely know my own phone number. Um, so I, I count on references. And today, with the magic, the magic of the internet, uh, you, can get, you can get information pretty quick. Whether it's good information or not, you all have to decide on that. So, so that's a little bit about that. So those are our objectives today. We'll see how well we do. Um, so uh, I was looking for some like really classy quote and that sort of thing in pre-burn planning and uh, I just thought it was kind of funny. I looked this up quote about fire and I said, you know, if uh, it does not do to uh, 
to leave the dragon out of your calculations if you live near the dragon. And that was from some unknown person. But in pre-burn planning, the important thing to do is to understand your land and determine your purpose and need. Most of you maybe burn on your own land or with your neighbors. You know that ground fairly well. So that's already way out ahead of the power, power curve there. That's good. Uh, if you're going to help somebody else, I find that a site visit is very, very, very important to, uh, to be ready to burn. I mean, I don't know how you could do it without that. And then obviously maps are a big deal. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, starting small and growing with time. And then I have another quote there that I believe 75% of the success of burning is in the planning and preparation. The day of the burn is the, is, is the most fun and most interesting and significant part. But what you do leading up to that is important. So I'll give you a, an interesting example. Uh, when I was, was uh, working in southern Idaho, um, we, we were left with some burn plans and you know, uh, to try to get some things on the ground. And uh, myself and the young fuels officer discovered that we had a planned burn. And, you know, the federals have a lot of other rules. They have something called NEPA. We don't have that in states. And uh, we needed to try to implement this burn. And uh, neither of us had ever seen this ground. And we sort of discovered this in the fall. And, and into the winter, so I said, boy, we got to see this ground. So uh, in, the, in the dead of winter, the only way to go do that was on snowmobiles. Can you imagine going out to check a burn on a snowmobile? That just doesn't make sense, does it? But we, we started to see the ground. Actually, the snow was a stark contrast and stuff like that. And uh, we then, of course, got out in the spring and started looking at it. And we determined that there were a lot of things that weren't going to work. Someone had decided, well, there's a trail here. We just use that trail as a place to hold the burn. Well, you know, the trail is about two foot wide in timber on a steep hillside. You know, you do not have to be a fire behavior expert to, to scratch your head on that and wonder. So we got intimately familiar with that ground. Uh, my young fuels uh, guy, he, uh, he had a young son and what, The Lion King was a cool movie. So we started naming little places after Lion King, things like, you know, the circle of life, big old mesa in the middle of the burn. And we had to get more familiar with it. So getting out there, seeing your ground, if it's your own ground, you, you know it pretty well, but, but now you may be adding a new dimension. You're setting your own ground on fire, that sort of thing. So um, land management goals, I've, I put that in there. I thought that was a really cute little guy or something like that. But having a goal in mind and your goals um, are real important. It is your land, and that's you know, the blessing that you can care for your land as you see fit within a few confines few confines. There's plenty of people out there to help you, and I've listed some of the agencies, the NRCS, Texas A&M Forest Service, our AgriLife friends right here, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Nature Conservancy, our agency, Texas Parks and Wildlife, and a myriad of private landowners and associations. We'll get pointed burn associations and things like that. Many of those groups offer great opportunities to, to learn about burning. They might help you with burn planning. Some of those groups uh, provide funding, pass down funding. There's on the order of, in Texas, roughly a half a million dollars of funding available for burning if your burn fits a certain characteristic and it's usually a matching type fund. Certainly that can take, uh, take some of the financial uh, edge off of that sort of thing. So in addition to getting help and learning where those people are, who and what those people are, uh, you need to have some form of a measurable objective. What do I want to do? And and that objective may not be an immediate thing. It may take multiple entries. I heard some guys uh, the, in, the, in the lunchroom there talking about, well, I tried to get out and spray some prickly pear, this, that, and the other. I wasn't getting what I wanted, but I think maybe I'll get it next year or whatever. So patience is an important thing when working with natural processes and that sort of thing. So, uh, But having those objectives, I often tell people who are starting to get interested in burning, um, we tend to be big bang for the buck people. We're, we're capitalists, we're Americans, we're business people. But sometimes starting small in a new venture and then, and then growing. If, you're, if your land has ways to bisect or dissect it, maybe just a small patch uh, is important. Monitoring your progress and uh, making changes, mid-course corrections is necessary. And then, you know, enjoying the blessings of, of managing uh, your farms and ranches and that sort of thing. Uh, most every burn, burn plan probably needs uh, something called a purpose and a need. There are a myriad of good reasons. They're probably, in my opinion, Far more good reasons, far more good reasons to, to apply fire to the land. Um, and uh, amongst them is just reducing the risk of, of wildfire by decreasing a dense understory of shrubs and harvest. So 
Many of you have a strong recollection of 2011 in Texas, well, maybe 2010 into 11, maybe even into 12, was one of the more significant wildfire years of memory, significant wildfire years of memory, that thousands of wildfires in Texas and millions of acres burned. Uh, interestingly enough, as we, we wander around Texas now or look at places, places where the regular application of prescribed fire had occurred, we do not necessarily see super detrimental issues. Now, no doubt if a fire runs through your house and your farmstead, yeah, that's pretty detrimental, but in the wildland environment or the open environment, there are some places. An example is the Angelina National Forest, I realize in, in the prairie here, or actually the rolling hills, uh, but had been applying fire for 50 years to their ground. Although they had a larger occurrence of wildfires, many of their fires remained down in the ground or the surface fuels and were more easily, more easily managed. Contrasting possibly out on some private land, same fuel type, same timber fuel type, but some of the land that's no longer intensively managed by timber management organizations suffered very catastrophic fires because they'd not been applying fire. And the places to stop the fire were often where prescribed fire had occurred. Another example would be our Matador WMA up in the, uh, the almost panhandle of Texas saw a large wildfire called the Bird Fire come in. Today we would probably say that was a damn good prescribed fire. Uh, it was not as problematic because the Matador has been putting fire on the ground for better than 30 years, that sort of thing. So one of the big highlights and big oh, selling points to, to a frightened and un, uninformed public, I might say that, I'm not trying to say that they're bad, they just don't know, and many of them who don't have have a pulse or a touch with, with a natural environment is, is that prescribed burning, uh, prescribed fire is uh, definitely a tool to, to prevent the catastrophic wildfires. Not necessarily take it away, they're going to keep happening. Uh, we know we improve wildlife and grazing. Uh, I used to deal with a group called Western Watersheds who were opposed, opposed to livestock grazing on public lands. And we said in a, in a publication, well, we believe we'll improve the forage quality of this area. And they said, oh, you want to put more cows on that? I said, no, we just said we're improving the forest quality. That means there's plenty of forage for every critter to eat out there. We're not discriminating against cows or deer, that sort of thing. But we know that. Uh, so ma maintaining regeneration, some of the species out there, without getting too detailed, grew up with fire, existed with fire, and fire is an important thing. Also moving nutrients that are, that are stuck in the biomass back to the soil is something that happens and then uh, species that are fire dependent. Also insects and disease problems, we know that fire is, is uh, of great value there. The other day my boss handed me um, an article and he men and it mentions there's a hot button item called chronic wasting disease. Anybody heard of that here in Texas? Yeah, mm -hmm. Well apparently they said that those prions, that's a cool word, that is a tuition word, prion, that's the stuff that, that's bad for chronic wasting disease. That stuff just can live in the environment, and they said fire can get rid of prions. So you know, that should just be enough reason to burn that five million acres to, to reduce that in itself. So I, I don't know the whole answer to that, but it's there. So uh, site visits and mapping, there are a lot of great tools in mapping. There was a tool, and it's a hollow link here, uh, and it, it's, it's called Map My Property, a product from uh, Texas A&M uh, Forest Service. Couldn't get it to work, but Google Earth is a really cool thing. How many people mess with, mess with Google Earth? Maybe that's how you got here, you know, or something like that. And the other day, I, I'm not, I don't make a lot of maps. I got great people who are doing that. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they, they talked me through it in like five minutes. I found a piece of land, drew a little square around it, started putting little letters on the side. I'm a genius. I made a map, 15 minutes. So, uh, and then I wanted to mention, there are fancy GIS software, some of you, I think there's some college students here, any college students here, you guys know all about that. GIS, that stands for? Guys in shorts. Okay, very good, no. <laughs> but some of those things actually require a little more training, if you got it, and they got the hands on. And then there's a method I've been very good at. For 30 years, I've been pretty darn good. I get this paper map, and I get a Sharpie, and I draw, draw the shape and I write letters around the corners or something like that. So, so uh, you, you can make a map as fancy as you want it or as, as unfancy. The idea is that if you've got some other people that you know where you are, you can use that map as a tool to, to plan and to uh, actually uh, initiate that burn out there. So 
let's see how we do. All right. Okay. Well, no, no talk about burning would be complete if we didn't talk about the law, right? Um, it seems to be we're in such a litigious society these days amongst the, uh, certainly in the top ten, if not in the top five, uh, issues about burning or detriments to burnings or deterrent to prescribed burning is, is legal considerations or liability considerations. So I'm, relative to burn planning, I thought I'd uh, make mention some things. So the laws, and somebody else is going to talk more about this than I am, I'm pretty sure. The laws of Texas, you've got to hop around between a lot of different statutes. Um, but uh, one that's in there, and, and in, your, uh, in your book in the front page, I've made references to some of these things in my handout, so you can look them up a little later. But they talk about two general groups that sort of care about uh, burning. TCEQ should be caring about the smoke. Brian and I were having a discussion that maybe they've wandered out, out of their wheelhouse, and that happens. Okay, so there are laws about that. And then uh, the Texas Department of Agriculture has some statutes associated with, with the law that talks about burns, burn, burners, pres uh, prescribed burners, and uh, what, what, part, what a burn plan needs to have. And I think the key, key element is um, that uh, uh, three guys with a box of matches, they can go out and you know, burn with a can of beer in one hand and, and their matches in the other hand. I think we probably don't need that. That's not going to get our five million acres in Texas. I'm pretty sure it's going to get us a crap load of trouble, really. Um, but it would behoove any any landowner to have some form of a burn plan. It is. It is for a, a certified insured prescribed burner, certainly for me as a, a burner with an agency, to have a burn plan. It, and, and it would just be, uh, you know, just a good practice, even if the burn plan was, was pretty simple. And we'll talk about the state actually, uh, Department of Agriculture listed some, some elements of that. So, there are some laws that, that affect you depending on what level you're at. Theoretically, if you just burn it on your own land, you just get the matches and the can of beer and you're there. But whether you can sustain that if something goes wrong. And a lot of times a burn plan has often been about if something goes wrong, can I demonstrate that I took all necessary precautions? And that's what the state uh, law is there because they're saying you want to make sure the thing doesn't escape and that you had a plan if it did, and you minimize the effects. So there you go. And probably maybe to step back in the discussion, I would tell you that, unfortunately, Texas Parks and Wildlife had its bad day in 2008. And while conducting a 250-acre prescribed burn on the Gene Howell Wildlife Management Area, that, that burn escaped and became a 6,000-acre wildfire that destroyed a lot of country, uh, required 42 fire engines, six air tankers, and a whole slug of, of people to fight the fire. Uh, I wasn't working for the agency then, but, but uh, what I would tell you is that really set back, that really set back prescribed burning in the state. Our mistake becomes your mistake, and we're only as good as sometimes our lowest common denominator. So they did have somewhat of a plan, but their plan that they didn't actually follow their plan. And that would become one of the most damning things for anybody. If you have a plan and don't follow a plan, what do you think the judge might say? Well, why didn't you do that? You know? So that's, that's a little bit of a basis. So these are, I believe there are, I didn't count them real well, I think there are about 10 elements that the, the State Department of Agriculture, Texas Department of Agriculture, wants to be in the burn plan. They set a purpose, okay? They want to know something about the burn manager. That may be as simple as putting his name, address, and phone number in there. They want to know about the, the, the burn site. You know, that may be that map. Okay. Uh, there's also um, who's going to conduct the burn? How many people do we need to do this burn? And, and in, probably implied here is what kind of equipment do we need? Okay. That description of the area, you should be able to say this area is mainly mesquite with a bunch of grass or it's a, you know, juniper, you should be able to describe the fuels and we'll talk about fuels in a minute. Pre-burn factors, what have I done ahead of time? And remember I said the planning and preparation was a key. Pre-burn factors, 
what do we have in? They use the term fire guards. You may not hear me use that a lot. I also saw, see those as fire lines and fire breaks, but it's a term that kind of got imported a few years ago. Um, you know, pumpers or fire engines, uh, crew size, the tools and equipment, weather monitoring and smoke, uh, what we're going to do with smoke sensors. So what are we doing way ahead of time to make sure that this burn is su successful? Uh, another term is safety and contingency planning which do, also they want you to be, think about smoke. Contingency planning is something I'm going to mention in, a, in this, this afternoon a little bit, but uh, in a nutshell, that's what am I going to do if the burn doesn't stay where I had planned it to be, and when am I going to do it, and who am I going to call, or who do I have to make sure that it doesn't become a 6,000 acre wildfire um, from a 240, 50 acre uh, prescribed fire. By the way, statistically, you know, Liar, uh, figures don't lie, but liars figure. Statistically, uh, nationwide, uh, prescribed burning has but only a 1%, 1% escape factor. So out of all the acres and all the burns that occur, 1% of those burns get bigger than they, they were planned. That's actually pretty good. That's pretty good. Probably statistically, uh, my drive from Tyler, Texas to uh, San Angelo did not have those statistics of me being involved in, in an accident. And this was a pretty cool trip because I didn't cuss or swear at anybody who pulled out in front of me. Um, but usually uh, there's something interesting. I drive about 30 some odd thousand miles a year in this beautiful state. And you can imagine, you just sit there and go, did their mama teach them to drive that way? What the heck were they thinking? You know, or something like that. So kind of a diversion there about that contingency planning. Having a good, strong contingency, a plan, maybe a few extra helpers on site, maybe even involving some other local resources, might be good, good insurance uh, when we're burning. Because as you start to study prescriptions and things like that, you find out that a good day for a wildfire in Texas is probably a good day for a prescribed fire in Texas, and, and there's not a lot of discrimination between those some days, that sort of thing. Uh, notification is very important. Uh, just simply communication, communicating with your near neighbors, utility companies, and, uh, and jurisdictional agencies. Um, you think about the risks, and I talked about driving as one of my greatest risks in, in my welfare and safety. Well, the risks to rural fire districts are actually going to the fire. They get on the fire ground, they can mitigate a lot of those risks, but it's going down the highway in a big old red truck with lights and sirens and adrenaline. and so notification, making sure that, that the county dispatch center and even the fire district knows that I am burning on the Smith Ranch today. It is in this location. The 911 address is this. Um, and, and it's OK unless I call you as a contingency, that sort of thing. So, so that those guys and gals don't go jumping into their truck and put themselves unnecessarily at risk. They got enough other, other things with cats and trees and, hazmat and car wrecks and stuff like that. So that's uh, the importance of notification. My agency has actually a state law that speaks to uh, significant notification, significant notification. Ours is in writing so many days ahead of time, that sort of thing. Um, another criteria is a, a, a burn, no burn decision or a go, no go. So what criteria are you using? It usually goes back to your prescription and, and everything in your burn plan. That sort of thing. And then uh, being able to demonstrate, I can put this fire out if it gets out, or even within, within my perimeter, I have a way to, to deal with smoldering things or persistent fuels uh, in, in the term maybe called mop up and that sort of thing. Uh, you have a link to the, the Texas Department of Agriculture website that, that has those same, same fancy words there. So. Um, you also have a link and, and a handout there that uh, I dissected um, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Burn Private Lands, Private Lands Burn Plan. We have just about 14 elements in ours. A National Wildfire Coordinating Group Burn Plan has about 21 elements in there. So just in general, when we talk about the elements of burn plan and a burn plan, um, we want to speak to that it sort of does become a bit of a document or a contract. It's something that someone besides you and your burn crew will look at more likely if something doesn't go correctly. So a real cool government word is 
Try to be thorough in your burn plan. Okay, now I'm going to say something really weird, but be sufficiently vague. Using wide ranges of conditions and don't be so specific. So I used to have some great people and they'd say, an EMT will be on site in case anybody gets hurt. Well, if I just don't happen to have an EMT that day, essentially I'm really not within my burn plan. I'm essentially, even though it's not a weather or fuels condition, I'm out of prescription. So I'll often go back and say, just say someone will be designated to provide first aid if somebody gets hurt. If the EMT shows up, yay. But if you just said someone will be designated. Um, same with this. Some people would say law enforcement will, will block, block traffic if there's a smoke problem. Well, maybe your agency, or you don't have that. Just say someone will do that um, or whatever. So that's that sufficiently vague thing. Don't paint yourself into a box because if you don't have it, uh, you don't need it. When we get further along, they'll talk about staffing or whatever. Uh, use your minimum staffing. If you have more help, that's good. But look at what your minimum staffing is going to be. So er early on, the early elements of the burn plan, uh, there's obviously a signature page, and that's, that's where the burn boss has said, I've gone over this stuff. Uh, and, and there's a myriad of burn plans, and you have a, some handouts to tell you how to get to them. And RCS has one. We have one. There's some great examples of ones from uh, uh, burn associations and things like that. They don't have to be typed up with all kinds of fancy things. I'd probably do a little better than just writing on the back of a napkin from the cafe. I'd probably you know, try to have some regular paper or something like that. But uh, describing the area that you're burning, you know, this is the, the Smith Ranch and it's at this location. Okay, it consists where we're burning. The vegetation and the fuels are like this. They're, there's sagebrush and juniper, and there's a little bit of decadent grass, and then there's a couple of cottonwood trees down in the, in the creek, or whatever. Are there some unique fe features uh, uh, or relative natural resources or value at risk? Is the family homestead cabin out there, and even though it's kind of run down, you would prefer that you not burn it down, that sort of thing, that sort of thing. Have we done any burning there before? Yes, no, how far back, that sort of thing. Um, the private burn, uh, the justification, why are we burning? And this goes with your goals and objectives, um, both long term and short term. Um, you know, we're doing this to improve grazing, improve habitat. We're hoping that we can reduce the uh, dead, dead amount of fuel from, from five tons to four tons over time or some, some measurable thing, that sort of thing. Um, the elements of burn planning, this is probably for a lot of folks a little bit uh, elusive, but the third element here is a prescription. And you can see that there's a low and a high range. I really suggest, it, unless you are you know, we, uh, trying to look at just a very significant or specific season, you're considering burning all year or year round, uh, you, you ride a pretty broad range. Because these elements would be somewhat of your binding contract with yourself and what would protect you is, I said I would burn with temperatures between 30 and 95 degrees. Well, if it's 96 degrees, you probably aren't following your plan. And uh, of course, you can go amend your plan, but it's better to think of that. So when I start thinking of environmental or weather conditions, if I'm, if I'm not as familiar with them, and I'm not necessarily familiar with San Angelo, I think it's hot and drier here than it is in East Texas. And uh, for a couple of days, it was pretty windy, but tomorrow it's not going to be as windy. So, so there you go. So you can kind of study weather. Weather is actually a bunch of statistics. Uh, those guys might not do well in Las Vegas or something like that, but um, there's a lot of weather data out there. They've been taking weather information in this country. I think Ben Franklin was like taking some weather data down. I'm not sure if it's all well stored, but there's weather data that tells you, you know, when your strong winds are, what your humidities are, what these ranges are. So. As you're looking at the seasons you're burning, you can get a parameter of it. You don't want to plan something when that kind of weather never occurs. You know, uh, an interesting example of uh, some parts of Texas, uh, East Texas, um, although there would be some good growing season burns, one of the problems is, is the wind is about like zero. We have a few state laws that require a little wind, and to be quite honest, for fire to carry, you want a little wind. So although many other conditions are great, um, the wind just isn't there. I might also mention something about weather. Um, it's not built into the prescription, but there are some human factors. 
uh, if you live in uh, a place where it's hot and humid, how well do you do walking five miles with a, with a flaming torch in your hand when it's 95 degrees and almost that much relative humidity? You might just might be limited by your human factors. Or in that case, you might say, well, maybe I need another way to carry that torch. Maybe I should get on a four-wheeler and lean out the door or something like that. So, so there could be some weather factors that just affect me or how much I do. I am just not doing the same stuff I did when I was 21 years old. It's just, just a little tougher for me to do things. So that goes with weather. Wind, speed, and direction. Uh, transport winds, as you study about smoke, and somebody's going to talk to you about smoke, so I will not steal that thunder, but that's going to be important. And then uh, environmental conditions. And this might elude some of us until we get more used to it, but we speak about fuel and fuel moisture, and you'll see those 110, 100-hour fuels and live fuels. A little bit more on that in just a minute. And then fire behavior. This is important to me and to you as far as to what I can stand. And do we, how, how much can we stand in, in the flame length, how tall those flames are, and how fast they move, because that may affect our ability to put the fire out if it gets outside of our control lines. And how big our control lines might we need if we have flames that are 10 feet tall versus 20 feet tall. So um, that's a little bit about that. That probably, for our, my biologist out in the field, is one of their tougher things is working on fire behavior. And I think there are a lot of good people out there that can help you. There's a lot of good guidance and direction, and we'll point to that. Uh, elements four and five in the burn plan are scheduling and pre-burn <coughs> conditions. So scheduling kind of alluded back to that. So when am I going to do this? When, when in the year? Am I going to be burning when things are dry and dried out and dormant, as an example? Am I going to be burning in the growing season? And in some places in Texas, you have like a couple growing seasons. It gets hot and dry, or in spring it rains, grass grows big and tall, it gets dry again, and it rains again, and things grow up again, so, uh, or winter time. And then scheduling may have some other factors. Are, are we hunting uh, on our, our ranches? Are livestock out there, or do we want to go to the trouble of moving them? Uh, some cows are pretty darn smart. They get out of the way, but you're managing them, so that sort of thing. Uh, so that's important. Are there any constraints? If you're in some of the coastal counties in Texas, they have some air quality things. We had not ever burned in one of the coastal counties uh, in April, and everything was right because we have to overcome a, a, a pretty constant five mile an hour uh, sea breeze, and we had the wind, and they called Texas Environmental Quality, and they said, oh, ozone is too high today, and we're like, ozone? Oh, okay, you know, so had a whole bunch of people assembled, and just as something that we didn't understand. So there can be constraints. Uh, you know, we face some constraints with, with hunts or nesting birds, uh, really making strong efforts here in Texas to get uh, wild turkeys back going. Ben Franklin wanted that to be our, our national bird. We got the eagle, and he said the eagle was a despicable bird. He didn't think much of the eagle, apparently. He liked the turkey better. But turkeys are ground nesters, and uh, there are certain times where they, they do not like fire running through their ground nests. You know, cooking turkey eggs is apparently not a good thing. I'm not a biologist either, um, so just, just understanding that. So knowing those constraints, that sort of thing. Uh, interesting other constraints. There are also maybe laws. For instance, in Box Elder County, Utah, it is it against the law to burn on Sundays and during county fair week. Um, how do I know this? I burned on a Sunday and the sheriff threatened to arrest me. I was really, really happy that our OGC lawyer had been a seasonal firefighter and she explained to the sheriff something about the supremacy clause and that they, it wasn't me that was going to get arrested and they would have a lot of work to do and he decided maybe that wasn't a bad deal. And later the county fire marshal actually decided prescribed burning was a pretty darn good thing and became our best buddy, but didn't feel too good to be able to have to sneak around in northern Utah by cover of night to avoid being arrested for doing my job. So there can be other constraints uh, like that. Um, some that you have, some that you don't have. Pre-burn considerations, fire breaks or fire lines uh, are important. <clears throat> and I, I really think that uh, if you're making regular entries, maybe your fire breaks would be permanent things. Maybe they're going to be your existing roads. Maybe it doesn't hurt to have some sort of road or disc line along your fence line anyhow because you got to go out and fix that fence once in a while, things like that. 
Uh, special features, once again, you have things out there. Sometimes we've got windmill, windmills or solar, solar panels or, or things. Maybe there's an oil or gas thing. You know, it's important to talk to those guys. We happen to have a, an oil and gas well on the Caddo, Net, uh, Caddo Lakes Wildlife Management Area that is venting something. And the company says, we're not going to get to it for months. And, but they, they said, but you shouldn't burn. And it's like, well, that's a crappy deal because we really need to burn, but we don't know what weird stuff is coming out. And then I'm like, you guys can afford for this stuff to come out of the ground? You know, and so just funny things. But those are features that you need to be aware of. Uh, some of our oil and gas infrastructure is much closer to the surface than, than we expect. And so it does not handle uh, uh, high pressure ground vehicles going over it. So be, be mindful of that if you've got those people leasing stuff like that. So uh, another, another area is, you know, so, so protecting those things. Uh, how are you going to get weather? Somebody's going to talk about that in a little while, but you, you might note that we're going to check the weather every so often. Before the burn, we're going to get the weather this way. Notifications, I alluded to that. Who are you going to tell? Um, there are a couple things in the air quality laws that um, I'm not too thrilled with, but they talk about not just notification, but gaining permission. That looks to me like a pretty, pretty tough deal to have somebody, because some neighbors aren't going to give you permission. So. You can study that law and decide how you're going to how you're going to do that, and that's getting permission if, if smoke's going to go into their their place. You know, I probably try to avoid putting smoke into an old folks' home or or a exotic mink ranch or something like that. Uh, but uh, just in general, you don't have to worry, and that's if you're a certain distance. You can you can study that that law. If you're having trouble getting to sleep tonight, I think it's actually in your handouts that sort of thing. So. Let's maybe click here. Um, elements six and, six and eight, and these are numbers from our, our thing. You could do it a lot of different ways. Who am I going to get to burn, and what kind of equipment am I going to get uh, to do it? Uh, a lot of times, the workhorse on, on uh, burning is is our uh, uh, UTVs and ATVs uh, with weed sprayers, um, and uh, uh, or uh, you know just some of our agricultural equipment. Just recently. Um, I, I built a, uh, a uh, small skid-mounted unit that I've been testing out. My goal when I built this was to be able to buy everything for it in a farm store and keep the price low. You can go out and buy a pretty fancy skid unit for about three to four thousand dollars. I was able to build this little skid unit with those square tanks that they they have, you know, at factories and such, and a pump from the farm store and, a, and some hose. And I'm under $800 now. It can fit in the back of a pickup. You can fill it all the way up to 270 gallons or, or less, depending on the size of your truck. And we're going to do a little testing on it and then send a little podcast out about how a handy person could build something like that. Uh, but we wanted to kind of keep it simple but still have an adequate amount of water. Obviously, I work for an agency that rolls up with really big, fancy fire trucks. I think those are a little intimidating and somewhat out of reach for most people. That sort of thing. So equipment is important to list that as well as the people. How big is my crew? Um, who's in charge? Uh, sometimes a little chart or a table. Communications. How are we going to talk to each other? Some of these burns are pretty big places. And uh, as I mentioned, I don't have a real loud voice. and I might not be able to holler all day. So are we going to use radios or cell phones, things like that? I think there's a handout. I don't know if it got in there. But we, we've shared some information on some fairly inexpensive uh, radios that people can get for 20 or 30 bucks, actually about 30 bucks. Um, and there are a handful of frequencies called MERS frequencies that you can use to, uh, to communicate uh, on, on the fire <coughs> and that sort of thing. And radio is probably preferable over a cell phone because a radio, everybody can hear the message, where a cell phone is just me and you, that sort of thing. And amazingly enough, they don't work, those cell phones don't work everywhere, e even, even in, uh, in urban places and that sort of thing. Uh, safety, what are some specific safety hazards? How are we going to deal with those things? I mean, there's certain risks associated with burning. Maybe there's a highway nearby, that sort of thing. And if somebody gets hurt, how are we going to help them out? What's our plan? Uh, we even have a little map that says how to get to the hospital if we have to drive somebody to the hospital. And then back to the beginning, we use the 911 address because uh, when you call the 911 operator or the 911, they like that address. That's how they route people there. They may or may not know the Smith Farm, but they might know 648 
uh, County Road 452 or something like that, and that sort of thing. Um, so being aware of that. One thing to be, be mindful of is somebody gets burned, do make sure that they're well cared for. Burns are very, very debilitating injuries. Originally they, they hurt bad, but they get worse, and it's real important to maybe follow up. Uh, many agencies have a requirement that somebody be seen by a burn specialist, and that sort of thing. Hopefully you'll not do that, uh, that sort of thing. So those are a couple of the elements. Uh, there's a section in there about a test burn, and uh, I always say a test burn is just that, it's a test. You know, maybe everything's looking real good for the fire that day, but uh, you're just not sure. So you find an isolated place or a, a, scent, a, a, a place on your burn, not sort of isolated, but a place where you might be able to put it out, and you light a little fire, and based on the conditions, uh, you can make a decision. And the test burns either, yep, work good, or nah, uh, we'll come back another day. It's just a test, okay? Um, so you, you describe where that is. And you might somewhere on your burn plan write down, test burn went good, and we're ready to go. The ignition plan, uh, and I don't necessarily write this that, that uh, intently, basically talks about some of the ignition techniques. Somebody else is going to do a little talk about that. Um, but how are we going to do it? We're going to fire a certain part of it uh, and let the fire back, and we're going to close it in, and then we're going to light a different kind of fire, or head fire, and let it run into that. The holding plan, how are we going to keep this fire in position? We've put those fire lanes in or f f uh, uh, holding features, a road or a river or a creek or something like that. But maybe we're going to have, uh, have uh, Joe uh, drive up and down that road with, with his uh, UTV and his squirter. And if he sees anything, he's going to, going to squirt it out. If it's a little too hot, he'll cool it off or something like that. And then if you do have some things that are smoldering that are going to make nuisance smoke, or maybe it might settle in. Somebody talks about smoke, they'll talk about it. It gets worse in the evening when things cool down. So maybe we'll mop things up. Theoretically, the state law, although I don't know that we're going to get, get it done, says everything's supposed to be out by, by sunset or, or thereabouts. Well, there are, you know, there are cow turds that are going to smoke all night and that sort of thing. If they're close to the fire line or close to a, the road, some sort of heavy fuel, not necessarily a cow turd, you might want to deal with it. That's that term mop up, making sure that those things don't escape or aren't a nuisance and that sort of thing. Um, contingency planning, and I'll talk more about that in the, in the afternoon, but it's a plan of action if the fire escapes. What am I going to do if the fire doesn't stay where I planned to be? And, who's, and the resources that are going to help me, and then how am I going to get more help? And uh, or maybe I'll even put some things in there. So I'm burning the pasture in the middle of my, my ranch, and that's a 300-acre pasture, but I've got a 1,000-acre ranch. And so I might be able to uh, let fire hop into the next pasture and pick it up at the next road, but probably my neighbors aren't going to accept my, my prescribed fire onto their ground, so I definitely need to stop it before it leaves my ground. So a little bit about contingency planning. If you can get your neighbor to buy into that, that's good, but you know, you're know, probably a better diplomat than I am because sometimes neighbors aren't really looking for that unless they're involved in the burning as well. Um, and so you, know, you look at those things and then a trigger point. At, at some point in time, I'm going to have to call for help if what I have on scene, my own crew can't do it. And I should honor that. If you set up a, a trigger point, you need to honor it and call and to get, get that help and then uh, deal, deal with that. Smoke management and air quality is something we should talk about. It's in the, it's in the, uh, the state plan. And uh, you know, there, there are some regulations associated with smoke and uh, smoke is probably one of the big deterrents or detriments to burning in many environments. Kansas does a great deal of burning, great deal of burning, however, um, they have some places in the Flint Hills where just the way the smoke goes, kind of goes north and then like it takes a, a right turn and it goes to like their biggest uh, urban center and, and, and they, they catch heck for it. And they're trying to do such good work out there. Quite frankly, probably the big, you know, I'm not a, a super scientist, but I'm sure the urban center is making a lot worse smoke driving all them cars up and down the road than the grass scented smoke that, that they see, but they can see that smoke. We, we have some coastal wildlife management areas near Beaumont, Texas. Now, I have no idea what they're doing at those refineries, but apparently the people in Beaumont do not like our grass-scented smoke. They much prefer the smoke from the refinery. That's a personal choice, 
So we have to, we have to get at least eight miles an hour of wind to overcome the constant uh, five mile an hour sea breeze and that, that sort of thing because we don't want to give them our nice uh, grass scented smoke or whatever. People are sensitive. Um, also, you know, there are, are individuals who have huge sensitivities to smoke. So I love this. I love this. My wife calls this the Marge Simpson sisters story. Anybody remember Marge's sisters? Okay. So um, I'm, I'm in a large public meeting in Colorado talking about prescribed burning and that we're going to do about 8,000 acre prescribed burn in the timber, been planned for years, well, well planned, well set up, well designed. And a lot of the folks who live in that environment, they're pretty supportive of it. In fact, some of them say, well, can you do more? Can you burn my place? I think it's good. We've seen those big fires. And, and these two ladies catch me in the side of the meeting and they go, <coughs> we, we don't like all that smoke. It just really bothers us. And the lady's going, <laughs> and my wife says, I don't remember this as well. My wife had come up with me. She goes, you were so nice to them. And I said, I think I probably like blacked out because I wanted to use my inside voice to tell Marge Simpson's sisters what I really thought of them. But sometimes there's no utility to that and that sort of thing. Smoke is a huge thing. We're going to keep learning about smoke. We're, we are better off in Texas than some places, but we're not as well off as we could be it would behoove us as burners to, to be as good as possible to manage smoke. You sure don't want to put smoke like across a road and have a situation where somebody get a wreck. Uh, the state law on that could be changing, uh, but essentially you want to use responsibility, that sort of thing, planning which way that goes. And there's some smoke tools and I will not steal that, that talker's thunder, that sort of thing. But it's a, smoke will become a bigger deal if it's not already there. The last element is post-burn activities and maps. And, uh, you know, so what am I, what am I going to do? Am I going to study things? Am I going to take some pictures? Am I going to see what I did? Uh, am I going to call the people I notified, like the 911 dispatch center said, hey, my fire's all done. So those are just some things that you're going to do, making sure the, the, that there's no more fire, that, oh, darn, there's some fence posts that are smoldering still. I either need to put them out or expect to replace them or stuff like that. And then uh, the maps are supposed to be in there. I love maps. I've liked them since I was a kid. I do, a, do ones with pencil, and I'm learning how to do ele fancy electric ones. But one thing I, I pointed out on the map is um, a lot of times we've got neighbors and friends who are helping us, people who are not from our place, and they don't know where, where the old uh, water well site is because the water well site's gone. It's all grown over. But, but you know that because you grew up there, you know? Um, so sometimes having... Uh, uh, points like A, B, and C, so that you know when you get up against that county road uh, 2961 uh, that you're between A and B. Sometimes fire people go Alpha and Bravo, that's cool, uh, and stuff like that. Um, so, uh, and, and, and any significant uh, things there. Some people go as far as, especially if they have a lot of different people, they'll, they'll mark something, they'll go staple a pie plate to a fence post and it'll say A, so you'll know, well, I'm, I'm at A. Uh, today, with really sophisticated things like our telephones and all, uh, you can actually download a map and your little blue dot will wander all around it there. Um, but I, I tell uh, our young people, uh, occasionally look up at where you're going just in case you're going to like walk into a, a well hole or something like that or whatnot. So don't, don't let technology get in your way. So <clears throat> those are uh, the last two elements of the burn plan. And uh, I listed some sources, and they're in your handout. Um, the Prescribed Burn Alliance of Texas has some real good information. NRCS has a fairly detailed burn plan. They use a spreadsheet, and you can fill in the blanks. It's, it's linked off of their, um, their website. AgriLife also has uh, a section on the burn plan, and there's others. Uh, TFS has some information, but uh, a lot of their stuff is moving past their money. They're not as eager uh, in prescribed fire at this moment. And then our website, our, our landing page, has uh, our public lands burn, our private lands burn plan. And uh, you can grab that. It's a Word document. And you can like click in, fill in the blanks, uh, which is what we do when we're helping landowners. And so that, that uh, th those are some sites. Uh, Oklahoma State University, I'm not trying to tout uh, another state or whatever, but uh, they've got a couple couple cool things. They've got some little burn plan things. Uh, if you go back to um, um, 
the, uh, the, the link, or, and I think I've got it listed in your handouts. Uh, meeting those basic <coughs> 10 elements is a, is a key thing in, in, the, burn, in the burn plan uh, to uh, help you execute a better burn. That's part of the planning and the preparation. And then additionally, um, to meet um, some uh, legal requirements and that sort of thing. Uh, mo most of the time, the, the implementers of the burn are the ones who look at the burn plan only when something goes wrong do, do the money guns and lawyers look at the burn plan. And remember, those people, they don't know nothing about natural resources. Never once when I studied natural resources did anybody sitting next to me in the classroom say, I'm going to be a lawyer. But today, those people, including judges, coming from a federal system, we have judges every day making decisions on natural resource management who have no frame of reference on that, but they think they do and bless their hearts on that.